Hello AP STAT students, this is Mr. Hazelhorst with your first video for Chapter 4. You get to watch this one in class uh, since I am gone today. Um, I do want to make note that this will also be posted up on our classroom website, so if there's some information you don't feel like uh, you picked up well enough today in class, if you want to go back and watch through this, uh, you'll have the opportunity to do so uh, through the classroom website. Please make note that you are going to need your textbook uh, and your graphing calculator. So. If you don't already have those things, go ahead and pull those out at this time. Uh, if you don't have your book, please don't leave the room to go get it. You can just look off of somebody who is seated next to you or grab one out of be from behind the double doors in the back of the classroom. You should also have a notes sheet that uh, has all the slides that we are going to utilize as we go through. Um, and so you can just hopefully jot a few notes down on there to help you as you go through today. Um, so let's get started. As we talked about last week, uh, as we introduced Chapter 4, we said that we were going to begin working with curved data. Uh, data that in its original form, if we create a scatter plot, uh, takes on the form of being in a curve. And our goal in Chapter 4 is to take that curved data and to straighten it out so that we can apply all of our techniques that we learned in Chapter 3. So what we're basically going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of information uh, but the main part of this video is we're just basically going to go through an example. Uh, we're going to walk through a problem from beginning to end uh, and basically look at all of our concepts from Chapter 3 uh, in terms of creating a scatter plot, um, creating a line of regression, uh, creating a residual plot. And we're going to look at all of those concepts and how they apply here in Chapter 4 uh, through the idea of an exponential growth model. So let's begin with a little definition here. All right. Uh, when we talk about the difference between linear versus exponential growth, uh, what we need to recognize is that linear growth, um, that increases by a fixed amount. Uh, that's what our slope is representing, right? We have this fixed amount that as I go from one point to the next, um, that this pattern uh, emerges, and that's that linear growth. Exponential growth is based on a fixed percent um, of the previous total uh, working along its way, all right? And, and this is what we're going to focus on today is this idea of the exponential growth model, what it looks like, uh, how we can utilize it. Uh, you'll see how we can make an exponential growth model straight uh, and then ultimately bring it back to a curve to properly represent the data. So the example that we're going to look through is on page 276 in your textbook. So if you want to turn there real quick, uh, we'll give you the moment to do that. Uh, this problem, as you can see, uh, it's related to uh, the depth in a lake. Of, uh, in a lake. Um, so at certain depths, what's the measurement of light intensity at that depth? So the first thing we always want to think about is what would make sense in terms of our explanatory and response variable in this problem. Um, and what would make more sense here is that depth of water would impact how intense the light is, right? We know the deeper we go in water, uh, the less light we can see, and so depth is going to have an impact on light intensity. It wouldn't go the other way around. That's my cell phone dying. You can ignore that noise. Um, all right, so the first thing that we need to do then is we need to input this data into our graphing calculator. Uh, depth will be in list one. That will, again, be representing our explanatory variable. Light intensity will be in list two and will be our response variable. Uh, so go ahead and take a moment to input those data here. Play a little need to breathe for you while we wait. All right, hopefully everybody has that data input into their calculator. I'm going to pull my graphing calculator up, and you can see that we've got that done here as well. So in part A of the problem, it asks us to make a scatter plot and describe the form of that relationship. So if we go ahead and set that up here, uh, I'm going to choose my scatter plot. We'll go L1 and L2. You'll probably have to make these changes also in your graphing calculator after our worksheet from this past weekend. So we'll hit Zoom 9. And there's our scatter plot. We can definitely see there's a curve to this 
uh, set of data. Uh, you know, it doesn't look too far off from a line, but there's definitely a curve there. Uh, we can see that there's a negative association in this data uh, as the data is going down. And so that would be our, um, our scatter plot and how we would describe that form. So part B asks us to verify that the, the decrease in light intensity follows an exponential model. And if we go back to that definition, remember it changes, increases, or it could decrease by a fixed percent. So that's what we want to look at here. So if I pull my graphing calculator back up, let's go back into the, um, the, the list menu here. And it says we want to start with the very first number. We want to show uh, that the second number is a certain percentage of the first. So if I take 120.42 and I divide it by 168, which is the previous value, we can see that our second value is a little bit less than 72% of the first value. So let's continue that all the way down. And if this is truly following an exponential model, then these percentages should remain relatively the same. So if I take 86.31 and divide by 120.42, again, we can see not exactly the same, but pretty darn close. So we'll go 61.87 and divide that by 86.31. And then I'll go 44.34 divided by 61.87. And so on down the line here, a couple more to go. And last one. Now, what I want you to recognize, uh, again, is that all these numbers are basically um, about 72% of the previous number. And that's where that curve is coming from this data. The MySite presentation will be happening in the library in about three minutes. We'll wait till this announcement gets done. Nothing like filming on an in-service day when you can be interrupted at any time. We'll probably be interrupted again. All right, so again... Um, we're talking about the exponential model and showing that uh, this changes by a fixed percent. Now, on a normal logarithmic transformation problem, we're not going to take the time to do this. Um, but this first time through, I want you to see that it does follow a fixed percent. And so it's meeting that definition of an exponential model. Normally, we'll just jump to transforming the data and seeing if it works. Uh, that's a lot faster. All right. So let's continue on here. All right. Part C then. Uh, we're going to get, since it does follow uh, a, an exponential model, we're going to apply a logarithmic transformation. Now, you might be wonder, wondering why we're using a logarithmic transformation if the model is exponential. Well, hopefully you remember from your Algebra 2 or pre-calculus days that logarithms and exponents are inverse operations. So, if the exponential model, um, or excuse me, if exponents are what are causing the data to become curved, if I apply an inverse transformation, we should end up with a, uh, a straight line or a linear set of data, all right? Because inverse operations basically cancel themselves out. So we're going to eliminate the exponent by using a logarithm, and we should come up with a linear set of data. Now, in this problem, they're asking us to take the natural logarithm of light intensity. It really doesn't matter which type of logarithm you use. Uh, we could use a common log if we wanted to. Um, but in this example, uh, they're just asking us for the purposes of the example to use a natural logarithm. Um, so let's go ahead and transform that data. Pull my calculator back up. Uh, I'm going to go back up to the top of list three here. And we are going to define list three as the natural log of L2. Now, what I want you to notice, the reason why we're transforming L2 and not L1, L1 is, uh, is changing in a linear pattern, right? It's changing by a fixed amount. Every year, or each number just increases by one unit. That's a linear change. Uh, it's our L2 data that we said was changing by the exponential model, and that's why we need to apply the logarithm uh, to the L2 data. So we'll go ahead and do that. And you can see that our numbers change considerably. So let's go ahead and create a scatter plot. And hopefully what we're going to see is a linear set 
of data now. So I want to change my Y list to that transformed data that we just created. So I show my scatter plot setup using L1 and L3. Uh, we'll go zoom nine. And that's looking pretty darn good. All right. So since our transformation achieved the linearity that we were hoping for, we now know that it's appropriate to apply uh, all of our concepts from chapter three. So that's what we're going to work through. So uh, step D, if you're looking in your textbook, it says calculate the least squares regression line uh, for the transformed data. And then we're going to interpret the slope and y-intercept of this equation in the context of the problem. So line of regression, we'll just go stat, calc. We want to choose number eight. Now I need to change my lists here. My X data, we're leaving alone. That was all input into list one. But our Y data, we need to now change to L3. We want to, again, work with that uh, transformed set of data. That's what we noticed uh, straightened out the data. So we'll go ahead and calculate that line of regression. All right, uh, I'm going to slide this over, uh, move this out of the way so that we can um, walk through the line of regression. And I want to talk about how to interpret these values in the context of the problem. So if we write the line of regression, our line of regression would just simply be uh, y hat is equal to uh, 6.7, uh, we'll round it to 9, minus 0.33x. Now, that was our transformation and how we would write that transformation back in chapter 3. But what we need to recognize here is that we applied a transformation. We applied something to one of these pieces of data. All right? And what we transformed was y. Well, how did we transform y? We applied a natural logarithm. So that means I'm just going to add in the ln on the y data. Because we're not working with x and y, we're working with x and the natural log of y. So we need to represent that within our line. And you'll see how that infects things uh, in terms of how we interpret and then also how we end up doing predictions in the end. But we'll save the prediction part uh, for a couple slides here. So let's go ahead and interpret our slope and y-intercept in the context of this problem. So let's start out with the, the y-intercept here, all right? So remember, y in this problem is representing light intensity. X is representing depth. So we're saying at a depth of zero meters, Now, normally we would say the light intensity is, but we're not representing the light intensity in this line of regression. We're representing the natural log of the light intensity. And that's what we need to include in our interpretation. So the depth, um, excuse me, I'm going to change this here. So the depth, let's start this over. I don't like the way my set started. All right, so I'm going to say uh, if the depth, is zero meters, the natural log of light intensity is 6.79, I believe lumens is our unit of measure, okay? So that is um, our interpretation of the y-intercept. Again, I want to point out, we have to include the idea of the natural log uh, in that transform or in that interpretation because we've transformed this data. All right, now let's interpret the slope in the context of the problem, right? So what we're saying here is the natural log of light intensity decreases 0 0.33 lumens for each additional meter of depth. Now again, if we think back to chapter three, these are basically the same sentences that we used in chapter three. The only thing that we've added in now is the idea of the transformation. 
we included that it's the natural log of light intensity uh, in both of those interpretations, not just light intensity. We need to represent that transformation. Uh, we're just being honest about the manipulations that we've applied, uh, and that's how we best represent the data in this case. Okay. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. We've had some practice with that before. The other thing that I want to point out while we're on the slide is notice how high the correlation value is and notice how high R squared is. If we apply the appropriate transformation, we should see some pretty high R and R squared values, which is good. That just means that we are representing this data well uh, and these models are going to be effective for prediction and that's what we're hoping for. Okay, so let's move on to the next part of uh, the example problem. So we want to finish up here with evaluating the model and prediction, okay? Now, if we go back to how we evaluated our line of regression in Chapter 3, we said there's two things that we should look at. We should look at R squared, and we should look at the residual plot. Well, we just had R squared here a moment ago. We said that R squared, oops, excuse me, wrong one. We said that R squared was 0.9999. Okay, now again, let's interpret this in the context of the problem. So if you have your gold packet, we wrote this interpretation statement there, and it's the exact same interpretation statement. Again, we just need to include the transformation. So what I'm going to say here is that 99% of the variation in the natural log of light intensity is accounted for by the least squares regression line. All right, we know that would be a very high number. Again, it's the same statement that we used in chapter three. But just like in our interpretations of slope and y-intercept, we need to include the natural log in that interpretation statement as well, because that's the transformation that we applied. Now, the next thing that we want to do is we also want to look at the residual plot. So let's go ahead and do that in this problem. I'll get my calculator back up here. So to create a residual plot, we're going to go back to our stat plot. Remember, we always want to put the residuals in the y-list. So we'll get those pulled up here. So I've got my scatter plot set up with the residuals ready. Uh, we'll hit zoom nine. And we look at this data and we think, well, there's kind of a curved pattern here. All right. But because the R squared value is extremely high, the other thing to make note of here, if I trace, notice how small the residuals are. All right. Uh, this is representing scientific notation. So this is saying a negative 3.4 basically times 10 to the negative fifth. So if I move this decimal point five places to the left, I have an extremely small number. And if I look through all of my values, all of the residuals are extremely small. So yes, we see a curve in the residual plot, uh, but when we look at the size of those residuals, those things are itty bitty, okay? So considering that R squared was so high, the residuals are so small, we're willing to overlook the pattern that we see in this residual plot. All right. Now, before we get to the next part, uh, which is talking about, uh, if we look at uh, part F, it says perform an inverse transformation to express light intensity as an exponential function of depth in the lake. All right. So I'm going to take you through some very basic algebra work here real quick. And uh, this is the only time we'll have to do this, but I want you to see how we can use a line of regression to actually find the exponential model. So let me clear this writing off here real quick. We've got some room to work. All right, so in general for this problem, our um, our model right now, we said, was the natural log of y is equal to a plus bx. I'm going to eliminate the numbers here just so, again, we can look at the algebra, okay? Now, this is the line of regression that we set up, but it's really not a line because of that natural log function in there. So let's 
rewrite this. Let's apply the algebra, and we're going to rewrite this as an exponential function. All right? So you might remember from your algebra days, if I want to eliminate a natural log, I apply an exponential base with the same base. So the base of the natural log is E. So I'm going to raise and make both sides. Um, e is the base and use those as exponents. Now, the natural log, E to the natural log, those are inverse operations. They cancel out. I'm just left with Y. And on the other side, I have Y equals E to the A plus BX. So we're starting to take on that exponential form. But we can go a little bit further here. All right, we can actually break this up and write this as y equals e to the a power times e to the bx. Remember, if we're multiplying two things that have the same base, we can add their exponents together. Well, I can also go the opposite of that. If I'm adding exponents, I can break that apart as a multiplication statement. Um, and this is the exponential model that would represent this problem. Now, it all started with our line of regression. So A and B are still represented by that slope and y-intercept. But again, it's really not a linear function because of the natural log. So those numbers are what we can then use to model our data. So let's show you this on our graphing calculator. All right, we've just run our line of regression. So on our graphing calculator, we can put this information in there. All right, so I'm going to pull my calculator up, and I'm going to show you how we can use this mathematical model in our graphing calculator, and we're going to fit it back to the original uh, scatter plot so you can see how well it works. Okay? So what I want you to do right now is I want you to go to y equals, and let's scroll down to y2. Okay? So what we're going to input here is E, which we can find our E button uh, down on the left side of the calculator. So hit second, LN. And then I need to raise this to the A power. Now, A and B are predefined in my graphing calculator. Remember, we have this variables button that we can use to access any of our variables. So hit your VARS button. And we're going to scroll over, or excuse me, down to statistics. Oops, too far there. And then we're going to go to EQ. And you'll see variable A right there. So I'm going to press number 2, put that in my equation. Now I need to get out of my exponent. So then I want to take E to the BX. So again, VARS, statistics, EQ, and you can see B is number 3. So B, and then I'm going to hit my variable button, which is right next to my alpha, in between alpha and stat. All right, so I'm going to input that equation. All right, Y equals E to the A times e to the bx. And again, we just found this equation through the algebra, right? getting rid of the natural logarithm. Um, so let's go back to my scatter plot now, and let's go back to the original numbers, L1 and L2. Now, when I grab, when we hit zoom 9, what we will see is our scatter plot, as well as these uh, this exponential model, right, we're going to see the line go right through all those points. So zoom 9, right, so you've got the scatter plot represented in blue, and that equation that we just said in Y2 is currently graphing, and that's represented by the red line on my screen. And you can see how well this exponential model hits those points. It wasn't straight, right, it was curved data, but we still use that line of regression to work our way through. Uh, and find all that information, okay? Now, here's the fun part, all right? If we want to do prediction, uh, which is what it's asking us to do here in part G, all right, uh, if you have that equation set into your graphing calculator, uh, we can utilize that equation to uh, just input things for prediction. So again, I just want to show you, we have this equation input into Y2. Right? And it's got a variable in there. A and B are defined numbers. Again, those came from when we ran the line of regression. Uh, but X is a variable. So to create uh, an actual prediction, in part G, it's asking us to predict the light intensity at a depth of 22 meters. If you press your VARS button, and then we scroll over to Y VARS, 
and we choose function, notice we have the name y2. So I'm going to select 2, and I'm going to put a parenthesis, and I'm going to put 22 in it. Basically, what we've just set up on our graphing calculators, we've set up function notation. We're telling our calculator, okay, go use the equation that we put in y2, and we want you to evaluate that equation at 22. So if I press enter, there's our prediction based on the equation that we input into y2. So our model predicted that the light intensity would be 0.5842 lumens. And if we look in the book, it says the actual light intensity was 0.58 lumens. And it asks the question, does this surprise you? Well, hopefully what we say is, no, this doesn't surprise us. We expected our mathematical model to be pretty strong. The R value is high. The R squared value is high. Our residual plot had extremely small residuals. Everything pointed to the fact that this was a great model set up to that data. And so even though we have this extrapolation going on here, right, we don't have any information at 22 meters of depth. Um, we're still pretty confident in our model, and we can see that that played out as well. Okay, so that's the process of transforming data. Um, and again, I just want to buzz through uh, just a brief look again at everything that we did here. So if we go back, I was keeping my writing on, all right? So we've got our mathematical model that we created out of our line of regression. Uh, we interpreted those depths uh, or the slope and y-intercept in context, and we included the natural logarithm in those interpretations. Uh, we interpreted the slope and y-intercept in context. We interpreted r squared in context. All those things worked out great. Um, and that's transformation from beginning to end. Okay? So I hope you found this video helpful and uh, got some problems for you to practice on your own to just uh, firm up this information and this understanding uh, for yourself. And uh, again, you'll have another video tomorrow. Remember, I'll be gone tomorrow as well. But then I'll be back on Wednesday, and we'll take some time in class to help make sure uh, you've taken from these videos what I want you to take from these videos. All right. Well, at this point, I'm going to sign off, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.